and it's a great pleasure to have Sanjeev Sahota here to talk about the year of the runaways. Um, I thought I'd start, Sanjeev, by almost any interview profile of yours that has come out recently always mentions that the first book you read was when you were 18. It's become this like, how come you didn't read a book before 18? Um, you know, it has become something of a bit of an albatross around my neck and I find myself needing to explain why, why those, um, that situation transpired. But it, it's, it's true. Why? I, I don't know. The school I went to somewhere, well, it, I, we, the syllabus contained lots of poetry and, um, and plays and, you know, the requisite Shakespeare and um, can, memoir can as well. Him? Yep. You can hear yeah. um, but no, but no novels um, as such, um, and you know there's compulsory education until I was, I was 16, and then from 16 to 18 I did sciences um, in my um, A levels we we have over there, and so I seemed to go all the way until the, up the age I was 18 without reading a novel, and also at home it wasn't a particularly literary um, household, so books weren't ever sort of. Um, discussed or hanging around or you know it wasn't it wasn't a house with lots of bookshelves um, so I was 18 and I was on my way to to India to um, Punjab to spend some time with my family as I um, did and continue to do um, frequently and I was at the airport and decided I wanted to read something and went into um, the bookshop in Heathrow and picked up um, Midnight's Children you know if you haven't read a novel until you're 18, and then the first book you pick up is Midnight's Children, you know, that is a tough book to break it's, your literary virginity with. It's a, it's a deep end dive. It's a deep end dive, certainly. And I'm, I don't think I understood much of that novel other than this feeling of um, storytelling, more responding to storytelling in quite a deep and meaningful way. And a sense I had read something great. I mean, the, the ending of that book really just s struck me, even though I didn't really understand why the ending was resonant. It, you know, it did resonate with me quite powerfully. And it was a bit like just a dam, I suppose, bursting open. And I knew from then on that novels were going to form just a key part of uh, my life. And I finished that book a while in India, in Punjab. And I, I can't remember the, that day or the next day, I caught the bus to the nearest um, city, which was about um, Jalandhar, which was about 20 minutes, half an hour away, found a bookshop and bought just you know a clutch of novels to get me through the summer, and then then it just it was just one after another. Wow! Um, and for those of you who don't know, uh, the quote, the blurb on the this book says, "All you can do is surrender happily to its power," and it's by Salman Rushdie. So it's a it's a nice little. Circle. It's a circle. It's, it's, it was beautiful. It was such a yeah. It's wonderful to get that kind of endorsement, but did especially you, wonderful to get it from Salman. Yeah. Did you have you ever told him that his was the book that set you reading? Um, I've never told him, but I know other people who do know him have told him. And I met him for the first time um, in October in in England at at another festival, and it was um, yeah, it was a real moment. It was a real moment for me. So the, you become a reader, all right? Thanks to Midnight's Children, you become a reader. How did you become a writer? Was there a moment when you realized that, you know, that this is what you were going to do? I think it was a a gradual sort of realization. It was it sort of just crept up on me slowly. I, I was reading very avidly and very you know intensely throughout my sort of my university career so I'd, I'd, I'd be reading you know s several you know two three sometimes you know even four novels you know in a week ten days and and after about th I don't know maybe f three or four years of um, you know reading and reading quite heavily I think at some point I started just asking questions of you know the writer in the books I was reading. So why did they make that decision? Why do they stru structure the books in that way? Why tell it in that voice? Why use that tense? Why have that character as that centre stage? And 
and I think once you start, or once I started wondering how how does this book work, how is this book put together, what are its cogs, what are its sort of its its nuts and bolts, it's not a big leap I think to want to start having a go myself and uh, I, was, yeah, I was about 25 when I started writing the first draft of my first novel. You say it's not a big leap, but trust me it is <laughs> quite a, a big leap. I mean mostly people say like, oh how did you become a writer and usually the answer is people say oh you know I read did anybody in your family write and no but everybody was a great reader my parents encouraged me to read and uh, so you come from background where you weren't really not in a family that was reading and from that to make a leap as a writer there, there is a leap of faith it's an immigration of sorts yeah perhaps yeah I think you're probably right there, but I think all writers that I know are big readers. However, they got to the point of being readers, they're first and foremost, you know, a love of the form and a love of um, storytelling. And I think, yeah, if if you're a big reader and you start asking questions of 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 the writer, it's not about. And it's not a big leap to want to be a writer to then to actually write mm. the book. Yeah, that's 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 a larger sort of void to try and jump. Yeah. You, know, you said you you were coming back, you were born in the UK, but you were coming back regularly to Punjab, to the family village. And I think in other interviews, you've talked about having a foot in both uh, cultures. T tell us a little bit about that, because it, it's sort of an unusual place in a certain way, because uh, many of the characters in this book, other maybe with the very notable exception of Narinda, the, the people who are the children of immigrants in the book, are not very connected to that country, you know, to the mother country. And, and they look upon the cousin who comes from there with, you know, tolerate, they tolerate them at best. They're quite and, disdainful. Yeah, they're disdainful, they, you know, there's the yokel, the country thing. Um, how did you end up r retaining that relationship with India, you know, to the extent that you would feel that you have a foot in both cultures? It's probably a function of um, how I was brought up and where I was brought up. So my, my grandparents, my paternal grandparents came to England in the mid-60s and um, my father was 12 and it was 1966 and it was pretty much like everyone from their small village in Punjab, it was almost like the village just picked itself up, moved across and transplanted itself into the north of England and there was literally, and there was a so I was, I was brought upon an estate, a set of streets in um, the north of England where everyone was sort of of the Sikh community, of the Sikh faith, the all spoke Punjabi. It was just like a little like an Indian village, but but in oddly in with, with snow. <laughs> and um, so I was brought up in this place where, uh, you know, for example, childcare was shared, you know, people ate at each other's houses. It was a very communal way of living and there was, there, there was contact with sort of, you know, white people and and the world outside through school and so forth. It was still very much a traditional Punjabi, um, um, most villagey sort of upbringing. And I was only I was you know quite reasonably old, like seven eight before um, we moved out of that. And I sort of um, realised that there are other people in the world, in the world as well. But in that sort of arena, you know. In the house, my grandmother was there, you know, and we, Punjabi was the only language spoken, so I grew up with that as being able to speak that fluently. I think language is probably key to to it as well. Being able to speak the language, being able to speak it not just fluently but idiomatically, and be able to read it, um, and making regular annual trips um, back back home um, to Punjab because my mother's side is all still um, was and is still in Punjab. Um, but I think that just kept the connection, not only kept it, but deepened it as well, just kept that link, kept that link going. And I do feel, you know, I do feel you know, in some key important senses I'm British, but also in some equally key and important senses, I feel very um, Indian and I suppose specifically Punjabi. And, and the Punjab, the, when you say that your grand, you know, it was almost like they transplanted their village from Punjab to the north of England and settled it down there. But that Punjabi village in England and the Punjabi pind that you are coming back to, did they feel similar or was the village in England kind of in a little time capsule of its own? No, you're right. I think at the time at which they did move, you know, they kept the 
you know, they thought they were keeping the values and the ethos and the traditions of, of the sort of the the world they'd they'd left behind. But as time goes on, they sort of kept and you know they keep to those traditions. Whereas you know India moves on, and India you know it's the, you know the the modes of living and the norms and what's accepted and not accepted changes. Whereas you're absolutely right. What what um, whereas you know the the British Asians and particularly you know, my parents' generation and the generation above that a lot of them are still stuck in that sort of that that that. In, in that sort of time capsule. D did that affect you growing up? I and mean, were your parents l like that as well? Yeah, well, I, it was a very uh, traditional um, upbringing with, you know, so, you know, you, you know, in, so in terms of ideas of, I don't know, you know, marriage or success and, and those sort of things, it was, it was the values that were sort of, um, in Pinter, I mean, the ones I was meant to live up to were, I think of, sort of in India that didn't really exist any longer. So uh, this book comes out, you've said, out of conversations, in fact, that you had with people in Punjab, the ones, you know, wanting to go away, leave for the West. Tell us a little bit about, you know, these conversations and how you, as somebody, you know, the child of immigrants, were regarded and treated when you, when you met the the young people in Punjab who were craving for a chance to get to the West, even if it was through a fake marriage or in the back of a lorry. You know, what, what were the stories you were hearing? Yeah, that, you're right, it did grow out of conversations, but those conversations, um, it wasn't a calculated attempt to sort of draw people's stories. Uh, these are, well, firstly, you know, as you say, being the child of immigrants and being the grandson of immigrants as well, because my grandparents were immigrants from after partition from Lahore to, or, you know, to um, across the border to Amritsar initially, and so immigration has always been sort of on my back. It's it's the reason why it's the reason why I'm alive. Really, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for these mass migrations that have taken place. Um, but not just over the last few years, over the last ten, you know, fifteen years, um, the desire for people in sort of the rural parts of Punjab, in particular, to Make make a life for themselves in Australia, in the UK, in Canada, in New Zealand, you know, in America, wherever. Those conversations I've seemed to have been hearing all the time. Every time I go to Punjab, and often even in in England, I'll hear stories from. And it's open. It's just in the bazaar, you know, around the Godwara, just people talking about so and so's uh, managed to sort of sneak a student visa to get to Germany, or so and so's, you know, someone's got a girl coming over to talk about being a visa wife. It was just a very open i don't know whether they didn't think it, what they were doing was wrong but it, they, they seemed quite um easy conversations and as i say because i could speak and can speak the language um well it was just i didn't feel as if i had to draw their stories out i was just it was just they were just there almost waiting for me to just stand there and listen to and obviously ask questions i say so i'd speak to people in punjab who had been to england and for whatever reason perhaps had been caught and deported you know, you say, what was your life like? And they say, yeah, there was 12 of us living in a house and it was, it was violent at times because when there's 12 of you and there's only one job, it's, it's, there's no, you know, kindness is a luxury and they, it's, it's a very dog-eat-dog -dog, um, existence. And, you know, to say there were, and what surprised me, what sort of um, surprise, yeah, surprised me was just the layers of hierarchies that kind of exist in that sort of house. So I think in... In the West and perhaps in England, the media portray it as this one sort of homogenous brown mass of people coming over, um, wanting to sort of um, um, earn and, and coming over and earning lots of money because you know they, they're working illegally, they're not paying taxes and so forth. What they don't realize actually these are it, within these houses. There's very distinct and individual stories and the hierarchy that takes place, whether due to caste, whether due to what kind of visa you've got, if you've got. And if you've got a you know a student visa or a marriage visa or any t or no visa at all, it affects your status in the f in 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 the house and what kind of work you're expected to do in the house as well. So these seem to me really quite um, a world. This sort of this hot house in this house that would um, be ripe for a sort of a novelistic treatment. It's like it's like a sort of a weird version of the old boarding school sort of stories. It says it's, it's, it's instead it's a immigrant house kind of story. 
No, that is actually was something that's really fascinating about this book. Number one, these are, you know, we, we are used to hearing about the immigrant story and stuff, but these are the immigrants even people here don't want to talk about. You know, this is not the shiny immigrant, you know, go to America with $80 in your pocket and then, you know, you emerge as the CEO of some company, a startup in Silicon Valley. It's not that story. This is, not the, this is the kind of the story you want to shove under the carpet. And on the flip side also, you know, what you show in the book is that once you get there, that it's a lot, it can be kind of a really sapping uh, process just to make it from day to day, wondering when the next job would come. You know, that desperation of people, how a, a truck arrives with the prospect of one job and all these people huddle around it, you know, that desperation is so raw and palpable. And does it surprise you that despite these, these stories must get back to Punjab? They do, they really do. I, when I come to Punjab, I, I'll, you know, and I'll meet young men who's say they really want, they, they just, you know, I just want to go to in, uh, to England, I just want to, because it's like Dick Whitting and it's almost like the paths of paper of God. However much you say, there is no work, it's it's really tough, you know, you might be living on the streets, the temples, the gurdwaras don't help you any longer. They, j they just think you're, they don't, almost like they don't believe you. They, they There's this dream that it can't be any worse than life is over here um, for for them, because life over here is, it's for sort of the men, it's, it's 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 tough. There might you know there's there's you know the land because they might have a bit of land, but it's not working. You know, two years two years of diseased sort of um, crops, and it's it's a struggle. And they sort of give up everything. They mortgage their land. They'll sort of sell kidneys, sell, kidneys, sell, yeah. sell, sell their organs, take on you know just debilitating loans to get that visa, which will get them across to to England. But as you say, once they're in England. The work, it's in takeaways, it's cleaning sewers, it's on construction sites, when there is work. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a horrifically tough, tough existence. But they just want a, sp they want a share of the spoils. Mm. There's this global wealth, and they want their share of that sort of this wealth. And it ends up being a, a sort of quite a desperate, a desperate um, s squabble for the spoils of this, this, this wealth that, that some people, that a few people get. You know, get a lot of, and most people don't don't get a say in at all. And and I was stunned, and I think that might actually come out of something real. When the when they go for sh your characters go for shelter at the gurdwara, and they sort of politely tell them, you know, you can't stay in the gurdwara. Go stay under that bridge, but we'll bring you blankets. It's almost like a they they outsource their sort of their sort of their their. What I think is their responsibility, because because they're people of faith. But that did come out of a real conversation that I had with someone in the UK, who was living under. Uh, he did spend some time living under a railway bridge, and he said he went to the Godwara group, and went, they used to go to the Godwara in the day, and they'd sort of um, have breakfast there. Then they'd spend the day search looking for work, and if they couldn't find work, they go to the Godwara. If they didn't have any somewhere to sleep, they try to bed down there for the night. But the congregation in this Godwara started complaining to the Godwara committee um, that you know these men there sort of they smell, they sort of they're, they're putting us off. You know they shouldn't really be here, and so the Godwara committee said to them, "Look, you can't be here because." Um, the congregation is not coming, therefore our donations are actually going down, so we're not making as much money as we, we want to be doing. But if you go and stay somewhere else, we'll give you sleeping bags, we'll give you blanket, we'll come and, you know, you can come and collect the food here, and they'd give the food in buckets, like dal, you know, buckets for them to take and eat. It's, it's like, it's an animal way of, way of living. But yeah, they sort of um, wash their hands of the situation <laughs> largely. Well, I, I also wanted to stress at this point that even though the, the, the lives that you're talking about are so hard scrabble and, you know, tenuous, in fact, uh, and terrible things that they have to overcome to get there, and then once you get there, other terrible things can happen. This is not, this is actually not, uh, this, what I love the most about the book is that despite all of that, the people still remain people and they have joys and they, you know, they can, make jokes, they can tease each other, and uh, so, so in that sense, sometimes the weight of what happens to people, characters can sink a character, you know, you feel like, oh, you're just following the decimation of a human spirit, but in, in a way, this is also simultaneously a story of uh, resilience and how 
for people who don't get along in many ways still somehow you know tease each other in the morning and they wake yeah, up yeah i hope it's um i hope it's humane and compassionate and i wanted it to be just um you know you first and foremost i start with with this book i start with char- character and situation but for me character is almost just foremost and i want those characters to be as indelible and as and as real as they can and f- for that to happen they need to be just as fully human as i can mm-hmm as i commit them so they have to do sort of they have you know oftentimes these they do awful things to each other yes. and yeah i hope you know the reader is, remains with the character despite these things that these characters these characters do and they do awful things to each other because they're human and they will sometimes behave awfully but also they will occasionally behave tenderly towards each other as well, as well. and if, i think sometimes the tragedy um hits home that much that much harder if it's sort of if if the if the humor and the the humanity is sort of there to throw it into into greater relief yeah so maybe we should hear a little bit from the yeah, book I'd love to, to, to yeah it's interesting trying to read with but yeah <laughs> um so i'm going to read from a section from early on in the book and so the novel is sort of centered around four four characters there's three men and there's a a young woman and in this bit I'm going to read for you it revolves around two of those four characters there's um Randeep who's 19 years old he's um recently come to England from from India from Punjab and in this scene he's taking um a suitcase full of clothes to leave at the flat of his um quite secretive visa wife um Narinda and Narinda's quite secretive and Randeep is quite lonely he's quite homesick at this stage he sort of he doesn't really feel at home um either in England or sort of in him in himself really and Narinda's also new to Sheffield which is where the book is set in the north of England she's from London originally so they're both new to Sheffield and Randeep's um just um stepped inside the flat and Narinda's just shown him in she hadn't changed anything much it was all very plain the single plain brown leather settee a plain tablecloth the bulb was still without its shade only the blackout curtains looked new a pressure cooker was whistling on the stove and the whole worktop was a rich green pasture of herbs and indeed set his suitcase by the settee how have you been i'm getting used to it her hands were clasped loosely over her long black cardigan you're getting to know your way around yes thank you well at least the weather is getting a smidge and better now i thought the snow would never stop she gave a tiny smile but said nothing randeep wondered if she just wanted him to hurry up and leave again he knelt before his suitcase and thumbed the silver dials until the thing snapped open Well, you know, as I said on the phone, I've I've brought some clothes and things for you to keep here. He draped a pair of matching shirts across the creased rump of the settee, along with some black trousers and starched blue jeans, all still on their bent wire hangers. He took a white carrier bag, tied in a knot at the top, and left this on the table. Yeah, so we've got shaving cream, after shave, you know that kind of thing. Oh, and and maybe also some underwear, he added. in the casual manner he'd practiced on the way down he reached back into his suitcase and handed her a slim red felt album and and these are photographs i think we you should hang up he watched her palming through the pages the first few were taken on their wedding day in a gurdwara outside his city of chandigarh the later ones showed them enjoying themselves laughing in a florentine garden choosing gifts at a market they look believable to me she said yeah vagilji he he sorted it all out he said sometimes he has to see where we went on ho- on holiday he side steps saying honeymoon there are dates on the back but are there stamps on our passports yeah it's all it's all taken care of I only hope we've got enough i'm hearing rumors of raids there was a sort of frozen alarm in her face which thought in comprehension 
you you think this place will be raided, but but by who? Oh no, it's it's just people at work talking, you know. And there's always rumours, but but I guess it it is better to be prepared. Maybe I should, you know, maybe I should come and live here," he said, testing the water a little. The shock of the suggestion seemed to force her mouth to open. I wasn't being serious, but it's too small," she said. And the weather," she added randomly. I understand completely," he said, layering smiles over his disappointment. He couldn't remember the last time he'd been so warm in a house, with food smelling as good as that on the cooker. She made to walk him to the door. No, no, I'll help you with this first. It's not fair to leave you to pack it all away. Delay tactics. She said she'd do it later. That it wasn't a problem. Reluctantly, Rundit followed her down the stairs. As she opened the door, he took the money out of his pocket and handed it to her. Another month, she said. The year will be over before we know it. Yes, he replied, shaking his head, as if amazed how quickly the time was passing, when really it seemed to him that each new week took on the span of an entire age. I'll leave it there. Thank you. I don't want to give away too much in the book, but Narinder is is a really fascinating character, and. Uh, because you know often and we are all familiar with books where where somebody struggles with the tussle between you know your individual desire of for what you want and what society expects of you your family honor and prestige narinder who is the visa wife in the story is was to me fascinating because she's struggling between what the the family honor and those those forces and the desire to be good in a in a religious way and we usually don't think of those two things as being in conflict with each other but here they are really poignantly so you know she is really struggling with an existential idea of you know what does it mean to be a good devout sikh woman in a culture where everybody around her is terribly also very devout but it's not working can you tell us a little bit about that conflict and you know how you worked through it yeah, I, I, I love Renunda. I think she's. Um, you know, I don't like writing heroes, and I don't really want to ever. You know, I don't really believe in heroes, but she's probably as close I'll ever, uh, as I'll ever get to writing someone who, I think, behaves quite heroically in in in, in a really important way. She's um, you know, she's a very she's a devout young Sikh woman. Um, her mother uh, died when she was young, and she's living in a house with her father and brother who have, you know, it's a very patriarchal, oppressive um, existence and she pretty much just lives her life going to the Gurdwara and, and back home. But she does really strongly believe in this idea of seva and this idea of being being good, which initially her father's, you know, probably quite, quite proud of. But then it starts to run, her idea of goodness starts to um, look at, because she goes to Punjab quite often, Actually, what are the, uh, what are these immigrants sort of? You know, they're they her idea. Of, she can't reconcile. Should say she can't reconcile her ideas of goodness and having a good God with what she sees people going through, and she tries to sort of almost atone in a way for something that she didn't do in her past by becoming this this visa wife. And it's this idea of um, goodness, as you say, that I was really interesting so what does it mean to be to be good in this world and particularly if you're the ch a child of immigrants and it's something that i i do feel i i i think about a lot and something i i'm not sure what the answer is to what does it mean for me who has benefited from immigration for no for, for no nothing for, for nothing i did it's purely it's a quirk it's 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 a complete it's complete fluke that um you know, my parents or grandparents emigrated at a time when England wanted, wanted you know, manual labour. But why? But why does that mean that my cousins and the other people that I know, you know, back back home, why shouldn't they have access to those same privileges? You know, I'm, I lead a, a comparatively privileged life um, to them, and it's a question that I think Narinda wrestles with a lot, and she doesn't. She 
she's sort of still wrestling with it towards the end as she comes to a sort of a, a stalemate, I think. And it's a question that I think that a lot of, um, or I'd hope a lot of um, children of immigrants in Britain, like me, also do think about. And it is, it's a genuine do you think moral you tussle. Do you think about that? I do. I don't, what do I, do I, when I have, when I go to Punjab and I see people asking me to, you know, to, to listen to their stories or to assist them in some way, my response is it's, it's a difficult moral conundrum, I think. I have to, you know, I have to, well, I don't know what I have to do, but I, I have to sort of reconcile it with myself. Well, you can't be a visa wife. I can't so. be a visa wife. <laughs> but it is, I mean, it is genuinely a conundrum where as a reader, you don't know in what side of this issue you can fall because there is the legal side. You know, she's doing something that is technically illegal completely, and yet she's doing it for far pu the purest of motives in a, in a way, and, and you're almost, yeah, I, I don't want to get I, into I don't have a problem with, the legal side can go hang. I, yeah. I, I fully support her decision to do what she, what she, and, she does. And, and what is also fascinating about this character is that you've created a character who is so devout that others, you know, make fun of her and deride her as the turban wali and, and, and things like that. In normal, um, in much of our fiction, a character like that would be the, you know, we are suspicious of an exceptionally religiously devout character. You know, we think they, you know, it is my son, the fanatic. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so to reconcile this kind of liberal values, you know, the concern for the immigrant and all of that with, with a character who is so devoutly religious is, I think, also very interesting. You know, we, we don't think we, of... We, we've, we've become quite, in, in, in England, we've become quite deeply suspicious of people who do feel this communion with some other authority. It's something that we, we don't seem able to... Um, rationalize how that can be. It's, it's a bit like actually, it's not a, a million miles away from the way I, th I think sometimes novelists or, or people who read a lot are sort of sometimes seen it is, you know, because reading and reading, you know, literally, it's, it's, it's a minority sport, it, you know, wherever you are, and, but certainly in England. But it's almost like because it's something that only you are doing with, with this book. And it's almost like in religion, it's only just you are sort of experiencing yeah. it with God. And for people, so I feel it's it's that sort of intimacy is in some sense suspicious. It's almost magical or miraculous, and therefore I think people do um, um, either do struggle to sort of get get their heads around it. So. And now that you've written this book, in which you have really humanized the story of these immigrants who come without papers, and you know they are the ones who are cleaning the toilets and building the hotels that others are living in. And as a group are much reviled in the country. You know, they are a political hot potato. People want to, people want the fruit of their labors, but don't, much like the people in the Gurdwara, don't want to see them. They just want them to do their thing. Do you worry at all that now you will be, become like the, you know, go-to person on immigration issues, which are such a touchy issue in Britain. Um, no, I don't. I don't think. I don't. I think I'll, I'll resist that sort of um, pundit label. Yeah, punditry. Novelists shouldn't really be pundits. I don't think. I think novelists should try to. Too just late for that. We've all become <laughs> pundits now. <laughs> right. Op eds and appear on TV. Or all let's the use time. let's let's use our punditry to perhaps just frame better questions rather than just um, kowtow into what perhaps people think they know. Yeah. And, and what is really exceptional is that even while you're trying to put the focus, humanize the people who don't often get humanized, you, you, you don't shy away from, as you say, showing the terrible choices and betrayals they make and c the things they do to each other. So you don't valorize them in, in that way and you know, make them like the good, the really good person who has no flaws, you know, is always noble. They're not noble in, the, in that sense. No, there, there's no, there's no binaries. There's no black and white. There's, there's no good or bad even. It's just, it's, it's like I say, kindness is, is a luxury when you're in that situation. And, they do what they have to do, and and they find they do betray each other, and they do um, do awful things to each other. But hopefully, because the novel also um, goes into their histories and goes into how they actually you know arrived why. into Sheffield, 
in the first place. There's a sort of, um, if not an, probably not an empathising, but there's a sympathy, there's an understanding um, that hopefully comes um, comes with it. But they, 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 hopefully they're human more than anything else. And I think if I painted them all as good, would people believe it? We, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think so. I, I want to open it up for questions, but so while you guys think about the questions, um, I wanted to touch on one issue that runs through the book, which is the issue of caste. You know, you have the character Tarlochan, who is, as you say, in the hierarchy of these immigrants going as somebody who is from a scheduled caste, as he calls himself, a chamar. Um, you know, it, this is something keeps him apart from the others. And having grown up in a fairly sort of, as you said, the homogeneous pinned away from the pinned, how, how did you sort of become aware of these caste hierarchies and how they operated both back in Punjab, where there's not supposed to be caste, as, and how they get reinforced in, in, in Britain, you know, that the experience of immigration, I would have, you know, many would think that the, that the immigration being in the same boat together would actually break down these barriers. No, it doesn't. It, if anything, it just exacerbates them because it's a reason to push someone out of the way and say, oh, I should have that job and not you because you know, I'm a higher caste than you. Um, personally, I became aware of caste. I think it was just always, always. There. Certainly, um, when I used to come to, and when I you know, came to Punjab as a child, it was, it's just, the, I, the probably isn't supposed to be caste in Punjab, and certainly isn't supposed to be and um, cast in Sikhism, right. but it's just, it's, it's rife, it's everywhere, it, and as you know, everyone here knows better than me, it, it, for some people it controls every part of their life, what they, who they can marry, what they can do, what they can seem to be doing, how they're meant to eat, what they can eat, where they sit, even at, you know, at, at various um, tables and so forth. Um, so it was always there, and in England growing up, um, the same as I say, because I think the people who did come over the bend away from the bend, they just carried those those values um, those values with them. So it was it it has it's and it's still there to this day. I think it's only going to be my generation sort of um, who are going to sort of break those linkages and say, you know, notions of caste are abhorrent, and you know, to and notions of just you know codes of obligation and honour are stifling and and no longer should be you know my children aren't going to feel any obligations to do anything other than whatever they want to do on this earth brave words they're going to they're going to hold you to it <laughs> this isn't being recorded is it <laughs> <laughs> this is being entire it'll be youtube and one day they will quote it back to you um let's open this up to some questions from the audience um do we have mics if you can go to this gentleman Well, it's yeah, I think it's working. It's working. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, it's nice uh, to listen a British accent here. <laughs> Wonderful. A Yorkshire accent. <laughs> well, the question is that uh, regarding uh, uh, Punjabi culture in England, say, as for example, in Birmingham, or in near from London, South Hall, as for example. So I watched. I went there several times. That's some kind of what. One certain Indian Punjabi culture is existing inside the whole Bajar area, Gurudwara, and whole complex. But just explain us: is it a kind of culture which is Punjabi as well as in Britain born Punjabi culture? Is or has it got any kind of relationship with present Indian Punjabi culture? Thank you. Yeah, no, it's so. Yeah, and Southall in particular, which used to get called and still parts of it does mini Punjab because it is very, um, uh, there's a, s a really strong um, Punjabi community um, there. It's Punjabi culture tends to, as far as I can make out, and I'm not from Southall, so I wouldn't want to speak too much on its behalf, um, or even, you know, uh, other parts of the country. Um, music is a big part of it, and I think the music is what they've sort of taken and made it, you know, they've infused it with, with, with a British sort of um, aspect. So there's groups like um, uh, PBN, Punjabi by Nature, for example, who um, do, 
use the sort of uh, uh, their Punjabi, um, and they use the Punjabi in quite you know interesting ways because Punjabi and English get sort of mixed in a sort of a punglish it's it gets called it's almost like so a sort of a new language is being developed. But I think it is becoming more and more its own thing, and it's becoming less. It started off being you know heavily reliant on. Punjabi culture in India in the 70s, 80s, because there's groups that were big in England at that time, like Alap or Premi, which might not mean anything to people, but there were groups that um, were fronted by people who were um, born in Punjab. But now it's becoming its own thing. I don't think it does rely that much on Punjabi culture today as it is in 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 India. It's 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 been going for about 40 years now, and it's musically, culturally, languagely. Um, Books, not so much. There's not that really that many um, um, British Sikh or British Punjabi authors. I'm, I think I'm a bit of a minority um, on that score, but it's it's sort of it's 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 creating its own it's creating its own norms. And there was a question back there. Uh, I'm just uh, curious to know. See, when you start writing, especially in England, do you take it as a, I mean, as a professional writing or is it your second option you start with and then as it goes you, you kind So, I, um, no, when you start writing, see you are young and you have, you have started, uh, start writing, whether you take it as a professional, as, as a professional writer, that means you are a, going to be a, writing is going to be a profession or is it a second option you have some other Hobby? Yeah. Do you have a knack for a little hobby you do on the side? Do no, right, I'm, at the moment I write full time. So I started off um, after university um, working, working in um, finance. Um, and I did that for perhaps five years, six years. And I, was, I wrote my first novel in the evenings, at the weekends, at holidays. And then that was, that was published. Um, but about halfway through my second novel, I was able to become um, a full-time writer, and I've been doing that um, ever since. So, at the moment, it's 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 not a hobby. Writing has become my job, really. So, yeah. And and now that you're, you know, and what difference did the Booker shortlist do to this idea of you know thinking about yourself as a writer? Yeah, it it the Booker shortlist was you know, it was amazing because it. it it gets my work into the hands of more readers, which is the whole. It's, that's that's the endeavour, isn't it? Um, it doesn't change any sense of myself. I suppose it did give me, um, you know, that, a boost of confidence. You know, it's a great fillet to, you know, a writer who's only on their second novel. Um, that because you, know, you are racked with self doubt, and I do feel, you know, I think everything I write is is sort of. I just want to delete it, you know, and, and start again. But you somehow get through that and. You know, these sorts of things do help you just think oh, if I keep on I might you know I'll be okay that the book will will continue but in terms of uh, and you know the book is short it makes it made everything very busy for a while um, but sooner or later and now you know sort of life or the stuff of my life you know family kids parents it reasserts itself and things just go back to their everyday level as they should, otherwise I wouldn't get any writing done. You, it's kind of like, okay, enough with Booker, you need to take out the trash tonight. <laughs> yeah. I think there was a question right behind that, yeah. Um, first of all, thanks for a really engrossing book, but what I wanted to ask you is, um, the character of Narinda, you don't explain what it is that drives her to rebel against her family and go off and become a visa wife. It, you start off when she's already arrived in England. So what, what was in your mind? I mean, what, what drove her to do something which, um, you know, she did go and do, being a very religious person? Yeah, um, I think most of the sort of people um, and the women who sort of go down this path of being a visa wife, as far as I can make, I do it for the obvious reason to to earn money, it's it's a, a reasonably lucrative way to sort of um, put money in your bank account. Um, but I I, th I was very conscious that I've already had, you know, two characters in the book, or you know, the characters but where who were doing it for economic reasons, and I didn't want Narinda's rationale for doing what she did to be economically driven, and she's not and she's not concerned about 
the the monetary side of it at all. I wanted her reasons to be something else. And when I started thinking of what would make someone, if not money, what? And it was this sense of charity, the sense of wanting to um, do something to make the world a better place. And she does, so there's there's probably two main driving factors, three main driving factors. Once is, one is this sense of um, idea she has of Seva and her faith, which says she must do good and she must help people who are in need. Secondly, it's she refuses to help someone in her past who, um, you know, subsequent, subsequently dies and there's in a sense that she feels she needs to atone in some way. And, and thirdly, her parents are also lining her up to marry um, a man in, in for, as part of an arranged marriage. And thirdly, part of her wants to just run away from that idea as well. And she thinks to herself, it's one year, it's just one year of my life. This guy, at the end of that year, this guy and his family will be much better off. I'll have helped him. And after that one year, I'll go back and I'll live the life that my um, father and my mom and my brother want me to lead. It doesn't quite happen like that, but, but those are a sort of, I think, her, her main driving forces. One last question, maybe we'll get, we haven't had any ladies there. How long did it take you to write this book? And doesn't it put more pressure on you after being given so much, uh, I mean, the acclaim this book has got and the, the critical appreciation it has got in the form of this award, doesn't um, it put, put more pressure on you, the artist? Um, the create, the, uh, the you know the 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 creative part of yeah. whatever you're doing. Um, it took about four and a half years to write, which strangely was the same length as my first one. So I think having a job or not having a job makes no, no difference, difference to how quickly I write, which was a surprise to me. Um, um, I think it's like you know work expands to fill the time, etc. Um, it, it, I just I don't feel any particular extra pressure, um, probably because I think I put I have enough. I put enough pressure on myself to write as well as I, as I can, and with whatever sort of, you know, limited talent I might have. That, you know, there's no need for any external pressure, and I don't think, you know, prizes and you know, being invited to you know, the wonderful festivals and all the acclaim. It's br It's 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 wonderful, and it really does help from a you know with with a confidence. But the, you know, the person who, you know goes to the prize list or comes to the festivals or reads the reviews, that's not the person who sits to write that book. That person is sort of the best version of me, is the person that is the person at my desk writing. This is sort of the slightly... In a basement, I hear. In a, base, in a windowless basement, yeah, in, in the bottom of my house. Um, the person that sits here is sort of the slightly um, less good version of that person, I think. Um, one last, make it quick, short. I think we're out of time. Uh, broadly, what you're trying to do in this book is similar to what you were trying to do in your first, where you're, you were humanizing the suicide bomber there, and here you're humanizing the illegal immigrant. So what struck me uh, in your analogy between reading and religion, are you compulsively drawn to lonely, what we would call liminal, Figures, lowly liminal figures. Oh wow! Um, like a tongue twister. No? Yeah. Um, I don't know. With these, these two, both the books or both the the ideas for both the books arrived pretty much simultaneously. So the idea for this book was there before I even started my my um, first one. So there is some. They are connected in quite a deep way. They're almost like the, you're right. They are in that sense. They're very similar, but in in another sense, they're almost the inverse of each other. The first book is about a British Muslim who goes back to Lahore and this is about you know immigrant from India who go to so it's almost like yeah um, am I drawn to lonely figures I think I do find so I, one of the most important aspects of reading and writing a novel for me is uh, is, is a certain psychology that I think a novel can bring um, to bear on a character the sense of getting inside you know a character and a sort of that, uh, a sort of a kind of a patterning of that psychology through through language that I find that really um, really interesting. I think that's something that the novel does you know, probably better than better than anything else. So I suppose I am drawn to certain psychologies that I think will keep me interested for the time it takes me to write a novel because it's it's a long endeavour. It's it's to say it must be an interesting 
um, topic to sustain my interest and and those sort of meaty psychologies which perhaps are more given to lonely people I don't know perhaps that's why I've not thought of it but 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 perhaps in that in that sense and on that note we have to bring this session to a close. I am getting the signal. So please join me in thanking Sanjeev Saota.